All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our, our second class about uh, Lutheranism during the Third Reich. Um, we moved through the introduction last week, and now we have a new chapter ahead of us that I have titled Science Almighty? Question mark. And uh, the reason I titled it that is because, you know, there's a lot of confidence out there in science today. People, uh, you know, are almost looking for or they are looking for uh, another avenue of salvation, right, apart from religion and television shows and uh, print and the Internet all, you know, herald the, the merits of science. And, you know, science is going to save us and science is going to provide us with all the answers. You know, we like the television shows where people figure out these really difficult mysteries, you know, Batman's doing it, CSI, you know, science is what is what saves the day. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at science because science has got some skeletons in the closet. And uh, a lot of them have long been forgotten about, uh, but yet they were instrumental in fueling this um, understanding about uh, about biology and race and language and anthropology and, and all of that heavily influenced uh, the development of the Third Reich and the uh, ideals of Adolf Hitler. And I'm also talking about this because when we get to the religious angle, I want you to have these other perspectives in mind. You know, I, I didn't want to start out with with, uh, you know, what I'm going to talk about next week, which is going to be early church stuff. But uh, I wanted to, to give you this broader background so that you could all pack this together and, and have, um, you know, a more uh, a fuller understanding of all the influences that, that brought about uh, the Third Reich. OK, so let's jump in. Got a little timeline here. And if you have any questions, let me know. All right, so uh, let's talk about a brief history of, of science and academics. This is my timeline here. And uh, what I want to do is talk about, um, you know, this uh, origin of the species that started in 1859. This was published by Charles Darwin, of course. And uh, by the early 19th century, many countries were seriously looking at and implementing eugenics. Uh, and many did later did to some extent, including here. Uh, universities had eugenics departments. This was not the stuff of speculation. Uh, this was uh, the stuff that was being practically utilized in Europe and, and, and here in the States. And we're going to get into that some. Um, 1864, Herbert Spencer is, is known as a pre-Darwinian evolutionist, that he was forming ideas about evolution even before Darwin had his trip to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, maybe not so much always in terms of biology, but, but sociologically in society, right? And so he is the one who coined the phrase survival of the fittest. And, and this is often thought to be the beginning of social Darwinism, which, you know, Darwinism says that the species evolve and the stronger species reproduce. Well, social Darwinism is the same in society that the, the more dominant, uh, smarter, stronger, uh, well, what became known as race of people would be the ones who would, who would survive. Uh, then we have a couple of academics who were coming along towards the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. They were writing essays about Jewish people, saying that they came to occupy too great a place in German life. And then um, Houston Stork Chamberlain, who we're gonna talk about here uh, in a few minutes, saying Germans could become lords of the world if they defeated and suppressed the German Jews, right? So these were the essays that were out there floating around. And I found this quote, race was arguably the major theoretical foundation of anthropology in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, this was something that science was very much focused on. And, uh, you know, what you're going to see here in the in the coming slides is that this was really um, a heyday for science. I mean, people talk about science today, the modern era, but uh, around this time, there were a lot of things that were being studied. You know, Darwin was coming along, Spencer, as I've mentioned. Um, there were other people, 
you had uh, people getting really into anthropology. Uh, you know, so this was all, it was a very, I don't want to say exciting time, but it was a very interesting time for people who had an interest in science to be alive. All right, so let's jump into some of the people that influenced the scientific discussion of the day. Um, has anyone heard of this guy, uh, De Gobineau? Um, what I've kind of found out from researching a lot of these people is that back then you didn't just study one thing. Like you weren't just an expert in your field of like botany or zoology or anatomy, but you studied everything and you jumped from, from different thing to different things. And, uh, and, and he was one of these people. So he was a, an aristocrat. He became an anthropologist and uh, an author. And, and so in 1853, now he writes an essay on the inequality of human of the human races. Right? So you know something there is 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 not gonna is not gonna go well. Um, and what I've also found out is that a couple of these people at the time really were turned off by the French Revolution. Right? That they saw this underclass that had rebelled against the French aristocracy and overthrew them, and they. They, they saw this underclass as sort of being a less civilized, evolved group of people, right? That they would throw off the, uh, you know, the leadership in society. And, and so that got some of them thinking down this road. Um, but, but he started to write things and, and he wrote a book that where he argued or an essay where he started arguing for the superiority of the white race. And then, and then saying the Aryan race of the Germanic peoples was the pinnacle of the white race. And, and he also would divide people up, um, you know, like uh, white, black, yellow. And then he would try and trace European ancestry through those different lines and say, well, this group of people was a mixture of, you know, black and yellow. And this is white and black got mixed together here. And he would, he would say things like that to try and, and iron out. Um, sort of these racial purity types of, of, of histories. But interestingly enough, he actually praises Jewish people in his essay, um, even though his work does influence Adolf Hitler. Um, he actually has some, some good things to say. But he would later go on and he would influence some other people who then in turn would influence Adolf Hitler. So here's this this Spencer guy. Um, he looked like anybody to you? He looked like any famous Lutherans to you? <laughs> a lot of men today look like that. What's that? A lot of men today look like that. Today? Boy, I don't know. A beard? Well, the long beard, but I don't know about... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Those Prince Albert. Well, I mean, he's he's kind of kind of got the CFW Walther haircut going. Uh, CFW Walther was the first president of the Missouri Senate, and he um, he looked like that. But but Herbert Spencer, not Charles Darwin, is the man who coined the phrase "survival of the fittest." And it doesn't seem like at the time like he was talking about biology. He was talking about society. Now Darwin later seized on that phrase, and and he would write about it later. But Spencer coined it. Now, um, you know, also at this time, there was sort of like this lot of looking at society sociologically and asking questions about society and poverty was, you know, becoming a thing because now we're in the industrial age. People in the cities don't have a lot. Some people don't have a lot. Unemployment. And, and people were were look at looking at things, you know, very pragmatically now. But but it was a pragmatism without a sense of ethics, right? And so uh, one of the things that Spencer wrote, and I, he, I'm sure he wrote this before his autobiography, but this is just a source that I found online. Uh, blind to the fact that under the natural order of things, society is constantly excreting its unhealthy, imbecile, slow, vacillating, faithless members. These unthinking, though well-meaning men advocate an interference, which not only stops the purifying process, but even increases the vitiation, absolutely encourages the multiplication of the reckless and incompetent by offering them an unfailing provision. 
And thus, in their eagerness to prevent the salutary sufferings that surround us, these sigh-wise and grown foolish people bequeath to posterity a continually increasing curse. Wow, this used to be English. <laughs> um, yeah, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking, he's talking about there was, there was a time of great upheaval in Europe, but also massive European expansion. So they're coming in contact with these foreign cultures that are totally alien to Europeans. The Europeans see they're not as technologically advanced, so they're trying to justify at one level the European domination of the world. Right. But on the other hand, you've got these large masses of nationalist populations moving into the cities who are not doing as well for the rise of socialist movements starting in the 1840s that caused some turmoil in Europe. And so they use this, these statements like this to justify not interfering in the poverty. We're arguing against these social welfare programs because it's survival of the fittest. They sh should, if they're not meant to survive, they shouldn't have these children. And that if they were just, just a little bit better than us or the same as us, then they would be able to be successful. Trying to figure out how to get my picture to show us the dominant picture here. Any Zoom experts? Let's see. Kathy, can you black out your screen or turn off, turn off your camera? All right. I'm just trying to make it so that people can. All right. Sorry for everyone watching this at, at a later date. We're just trying to iron out our technical difficulties, which is always the case with computers. But yeah, I mean, people were coming into the cities and, you know, people were also looking at society and just saying, well, uh, this isn't very practical. How can we improve society? We have all these people now who aren't either contributing or who are a drain on society. And there have been some who have come back and have tried to, to clean up Spencer and, and say, well, he was much more than just this, right? So, he, I mean, he wrote a lot. He was a very intelligent man. He was a very prolific author. So, I mean, this, I, I, I did cherry pick this out of a much larger essay, which I, I know you wouldn't want me to read right now. But, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that's what he said. And, you know, that mindset was around. Uh, and, and so that by the time the Third Reich comes into power, you know, these questions have been asked now for, for 50, 60, 70 years. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're beginning to see a shift in thinking. Um, social Darwinism is a naturalistic form of evolutionary ethics. Uh, it sought to replace the previously dominant ethical systems of the late 19th century those based on transcendent ethical systems like Judeo-Christianity or philosophical systems like Immanuel Kant's deontology. The idea that nature and science could make a significant contribution to ethical and social policy represented a major shift in thinking. So as we're moving into the you know, industrial age in the 19th century and, and, and you have Darwinism hits and when it hits, it hits big. It, it's not like it takes a lot of time for it to really get going. Uh, because, you know, now we're, we're past the Enlightenment, so uh, we, we've had other worldviews outside of the Christian worldview that have been introduced into society. Um, among intellectuals, there, there is a sense that it's okay not to be Christian. It's okay to move out of the church. It's okay to look at the world and to look at life apart from faith. And, and people were doing that. And so when evolution came along with Darwin and then Spencer, you have social Darwinism. Now you have these evolutionary ethics that are really gaining a lot of ground in scientific communities. And so enter eugenics. How many of you all have heard of eugenics? Okay, without peeking, what is eugenics? It's kind of like we would do with, this is an analogy, so you can take it. 
It's like we breed cattle. We are breeding and selectively choosing who gets to pass commercial and civil. Okay. That's basically what it is. Okay, so using the example of cattle, saying that you know you get to choose which genes get passed on. You breed the the healthy cattle, the strong cattle, and you know makes perfect sense, right? Rationally, and um, right. And so this was the big famous picture about eugenics. And I'm sorry I can't move the um, uh, zoom photos there, but uh, eugenics is the self direction of human evolution. Right. There was the belief now with evolution that evolution could be steered. We could we could uh, drive evolution to produce the kind of society and the kind of people that we want, and we can use science and anthropology and philology and a lot of these other disciplines to select how we want society to go to determine which people should reproduce, which people maybe should not reproduce. And also to weed out undesirable traits and diseases. Yes. Plagues, supposedly, in human health. Right. To weed out undesirable traits and, and diseases, right? So, so Francis Galton was the big geneticist now who, um, who picked up on this, and, and he was alive during Darwin's time. So uh, he had said at, at some point, the discovery that variations occur randomly and are then transmitted genetically uh, raised the possibility that change could be directed. Uh, Francis Galton coined the term eugenics to describe, quote, the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. So, so race started really coming along very quickly when you started to talk about who should reproduce and genetics and, and who was going to, you know, which race was superior. And then of course, well, that's the race that you want to, to um, have its genetics carried along because that means society is gonna be better and we can make improvements in society and we can become better than, than what we are, right? So, so that was shaping everything. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, was said to have been posted at certain world's fairs, even in America, right? Unfit human traits such as feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, criminality, insanity, alcoholism, pauperism, and many others run in families and are inherited in exactly the same way as color in guinea pigs. If all marriages were eugenic, we could breed out most of this unfitness in three generations. And, and, you know, this was considered science. This was up at the World's Fair for people to look at and think about and, you know, assimilate into their worldview, right? And a little triangle over there. You can improve your education and even change your environment. But what if you really, but what you really are was all settled when your parents were born. So this, this real fatalistic sense that, you know, you're just your genes. Uh, and, and people still think this way today, uh, you know, when they do genetic testing and, you know, they want to know, oh, what are my genes? What did they make me? Right. And it's almost like the environment is just dismissed as having an influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, selected parents will have better children. This is the great aim of eugenics. Right, and, and this was the, the prevailing scientific thought of the time that people uh, were, you know, saw this as, as something to focus on, as something to, um, to emphasize, and, and people were studying this. We're going to get into some of them. Hitler's prophet. All right, let's talk about this guy. Um, so this is Houston Stuart Chamberlain. Um, he did study science. He actually was going to be a botanist. He was really into plants. He got sick and he couldn't finish his dissertation. So then somehow he got pulled into other things. And unfortunately, um, you know, that, uh, uh, that resulted in him writing about some other things. But um, he was this British German philosopher and um, he hated the fact that he was British. Um, he, uh, he rejected those roots about himself. He, he came to love Germany, 
German culture, German people, German everything. The, the saying, the, the funny saying about him was that he eventually tried to be more German than the Germans, whatever that means, right? Um, he was captivated by this, this German concept of Volk, V-O-L-K, which, yes, is where we get the car name Volkswagen, right? The people's car. Um, do any of you all have an understanding or a concept of this, this German mindset of Volk? This was something very big to the Germans that started to get written about by people like Chamberlain who were studying how the Europeans came to be and uh, language and peoples. And uh, so Volk was an idea that the German people had about themselves. It, 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 it translates as people, but it would mean you as a German were connected to every other German. And it also meant that you were connected to the soil of Germany. Oh, great. Is that right? So Someone says Marine. Cultural spirit. Yeah, a cultural spirit, right? Um, but it, it was a sense of pride, you know, that, that you were a unique people from all the other people of the world, right? And they, they really love to talk about that. Now, um, Chamberlain, like I said, he got into a lot of other things and, and he was drawn into these ancient texts from India that talked about stories of how the Indian or Hindu people were conquered by what were called light ones, which was then translated or interpreted as Aryans. And, and so he actually learned how to read Sanskrit and things like that so he could interpret these documents. And then um, he's, he's tagged to write this um, sort of history, I guess, of the 19th century, where he goes into depicting, uh, depicting an epic winner that needs to be um, after a struggle between the Germanic Nordic peoples and the Jews that the Jews were intrusions into Europe and that, um, you know, they're not supposed to be there and the Germans need to, to defeat them. And Germans also had this romanticized, uh, nostalgic sense of the past and their Nordic forefathers, right? That Northern European uh, men who I guess were conquerors and who, you know, um, were, were something to, to look up to. You know, I don't know if this is a Viking thing or if this is a yeah, uh, or or what it was, but but they had this sense of 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 really looking back and and idolizing um, people of that time period. Now, Chamberlain also argued that Christ was not Jewish, but rather an Aryan messenger. So now we're we're moving out of the New Testament, and now we're getting into speculation. Uh, you know, because. Uh, Hitler later on doesn't want a Jewish Jesus. He wants an Aryan Jesus, right? And so people would, would call Chamberlain later Hitler's John the Baptist, that he was paving the way for Hitler and, and laying a lot of the foundation that, that Hitler would later um, read and be influenced by. Um, or maybe a racial Moses that he was going to maybe somehow lead the Germans into their new promised land, right? Or or promised land type existence, because it would still be in Germany, but it would be a better Germany. Um, he believed that the Catholic Church, and I'm sorry, this, the source is Wikipedia, so, um, but he believed the Catholic Church preached a Judaized Christianity and that Martin Luther laid the foundations for a Germanic Christianity, right? So the, the things now that are starting to get picked out about Luther are not like his article of justification or, you know, his great theology or, or any of that, but, but, but he's becoming now this founder of something that was purely Germanic. And, and that was his claim to fame that he was, uh, uh, a hero of Germany. And people were looking back to him, like I said, not for his um, religious writings or his doctrines, but, but his 
heroic German sense that he defied, you know, the church of his day to form his own, his own church, which we know Luther didn't want to do initially. He wanted to reform the Catholic church, but, you know, they were not open to that. All right, and so this is what someone wrote about him. Um, to say that Houston Stuart Chamberlain was an influential figure in the development of Nazi ideas about race is a severe understatement. It can be safely asserted that without Chamberlain, the racial state of Nazi Germany would have been a very different landscape. For many, Chamberlain was the prophet of the thousand year Reich that Adolf Hitler and his followers worked hard to achieve. Uh, his Die Grundlagen des Nunzenten Jahrhunderts, foundations of the 19th century, became the unofficial Bible of the Volkish conservative movement. Right, so a lot of what he wrote was picked up by by people who also liked the Volk and who were uh, really talking about that and emphasizing that. Okay, so this is is one of the things that that he wrote here about an Aryan worldview. And, you know, the Nazis by their time, um, you know, had ancestry passes that, you know, you would carry with you. And, uh, you know, this was proof uh, for your eligibility to be in certain professions because, you know, as, as Nazism came more and more into power, they passed more laws that would bar Jewish people um, or people with non-pure bloodlines from having certain professions, doctors, lawyers, uh, teachers, you know, things like that. All right, the race pope. Um, Hans F. K. Gunther was a, uh, he had a doctorate. He was a university professor, right? He's at the official university level. He's teaching at Jena, Berlin, Freiburg. He writes a short ethnology of the German people in 1929. Um, he teaches that Jewish people should be seen in terms of race as opposed to being members of a religion, right? And, and now we're starting to really hardwire this into the mindset of the people um, that, that Judaism is not a religion, but it's a race of people. Um, he was extremely popular and he sold a, a lot of books. Um, Hitler was influenced by him. Many of the German people were. You got that nickname? Yes, Bonnie. So the question was, is this guy the one who really introduces the idea that, that Judaism is a race instead of a religion? And I mean, I think that everything, because he was influenced by the people who came before him that I just talked about, you know, de Gobineau and, um, uh, you know, Spencer, Darwin. I mean, all of this thinking was swirling around in uh, 19th century Europe. Yeah, people were starting to study these things, right? Because they wanted to have, uh, you know, Darwinism gave people the sense of, of having a superiority about race and about how to benefit society. And, and so, you know, you, you have these essayists and these academics who are writing these things and teaching these things. I mean, nothing's really happening on a societal level yet. Although as, as time goes on, you know, there are different governments that start to introduce these types of policies on a on a smaller scale. And of course, Nazis on a very wide scale. But, um, you know, it, it's not like you would say that he started it all right, because it's never that simple. But but there was a lot of um, discussion in academia about all of this. You know, so fast forward to Hitler's time. This was Dr. Robert Ritter, and, and he's actually going a around um, to the people who are not in the cities, to the gypsies and other types of people that are on the fringe of the cities. And he's drawing blood. He's measuring faces. He's looking now for this um, scientific proof of, uh, of Arianism. So here he is with a, a gypsy woman. And, you know. We know that the gypsies were people who were put to death. 
in the death camps as being undesirables and, and whatnot. Well, looks like I got a slide out of place here. This is what Gunther wrote. Um, the Nordic race is tall, long-legged, slim, with an average height among males of about 1.74. Face is narrow with a rather narrow forehead, a narrow high-built nose, and a narrow lower jaw and prominent chin. The hair color is blonde. So this slide should have been after the Gunther slide. It was redoing this all at 6.30 this morning. Um, the Nazis saw their practices as applied biology and believed they had scientific justification for their approach. They were eliminating those deemed undesirable in order to guide the evolution of the German people towards becoming a master race. In this way, they thought of themselves as benefiting society and creating a better future for the German people. Parts of writings or slogans from different academics were used to justify Nazi practices. The totality of their work did not support Hitler's ideals, but could be twisted and cherry-picked to suit his purposes. Science was also... Uh, propagandized to justify various initiatives of the Third Reich. Right, and so this is what Hitler wrote. The state has the responsibility of declaring as unfit for reproductive purposes anyone who is obviously ill or genetically unsound and must carry through with this responsibility ruthlessly without respect to understanding or lack of understanding on the part of anyone. So, you know, Hitler saw himself now as being the one who was going to have um, the strength to really carry out uh, these philosophies uh, that had been swirling around. And uh, got to this a little bit later than what I want to, but let's go through this as, as, as quick as we can. What does God's word teach us about race? Deuteronomy 10, 16 to 17, who is there? I'm not going to be picky. <laughs> All right, Fred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to make sure. All right, God is not partial, right? And it's talking about circumcising your hearts there. Right, that that faith is a circumcision of the heart. Um, yes, they taught circumcision of the flesh in the Old Testament, but there was also supposed to be a circumcision of the heart. Um, Galatians three twenty eight. Uh, Brennan. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. All right, neither Jew nor Greek. This was an important teaching of the early church, because in the early church, uh, you know, for a while they didn't know that Gentiles could come in right this took them some time even the apostles to really get right peter has to have this big lesson in acts chapter 10 where god lets down the sheet with all the unclean animals and he's like oh and they actually have to have a big apostolic conference about this right um acts 10 28 uh bonnie and he said to them you yourselves all right this is peter's realization about the tarp coming down that that he should not call any person unclean right and so there is this new testament emphasis now on equality and on not seeing people in terms of of race or language or culture, but that um, as we're going to see here in Acts 2, um, that all, all people come together. Do you have this for Acts 2, Tom? Okay, 2, two 5 through 11. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jesus from every nation in their faith. When they heard this sound, the crowd came forward in bewilderment, as each one heard them speaking in their own language. What are we amazed at? Are not all these men who are free to pray? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Greeks, Romanites, <laughs> residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Nigeria, and there is a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, you picked the winner there. <laughs> Visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism. Christians and Arabs, 
All right, so Pentecost is about um, that there are no more divisions of the flesh, but that baptism makes everyone equally um, the same, uh, that it doesn't matter where you're from, your culture, your language, uh, your racial features, whatever, but that you know when you come into the church that we're all one in Christ and there are no divisions we're all brothers and sisters, right? Somehow they, they sort of miss this lesson um, in this time period. And then lastly, what does God teach us about human wisdom, right? What are the limits of science here? First Corinthians, uh, Brennan. Where is the one who's wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and a folly to Gentiles. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, you know, every time is going to have its science, its philosophy, its worldview, uh, but, but Christianity uh, endures throughout history. And, uh, you know, when it is interpreted properly, it, uh, it brings about peace, it brings about love, it brings about mercy. When it is not interpreted properly, um, whether that's by groups within the church or outside the church, science, whatever, uh, you end up getting these types of mistakes. And so science is not without error. Science is not without its um, tendency to get things wrong. All right, just to wrap up here, next week, we will discuss the terms anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. Is there a difference? Did early Christian preachers and writers such as Martyr, Chrysostom, Augustine, and Aquinas lay the foundation for anti-Semitism? How did early church preachers use the New Testament parables of judgment in regards to the Jews? How are we to understand them today? So we're going to start to get into some real serious stuff next week, um, uh, Christian-wise, and we're going to look at, at what some of these uh, folks were preaching. All right, let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We thank you for all the goodness we have through your son, Jesus Christ, who makes us all um, equal and dismisses all divisions between peoples. Uh, we thank you, God, that you have redeemed us all equally uh, through the blood of your son and that we have salvation in you and in you alone. In your name we pray.